makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The Fed's Loretta Messer says policymakers should gain confidence to cut later this year, but adds there's no need to rush. Her comments echo those of other Fed speakers. Moody's cuts New York Community Bank Corp to junk after a rout triggered by a surprise quarterly loss and a move to slash its dividend. Well, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says commercial property is a worry, but regulators, she says, are on it. Plus, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is set to meet Israeli leaders in the coming hours as Hamas suggests it's open to a new ceasefire and hostage release deal. So good morning, everyone. A lot going on in the news today. Let's start by looking at what the European markets map is telling us. Again, a bit of fluctuation across bonds, but also across stocks. This is the equity open about an hour ago. You can see it's kind of oscillating between gains and losses. The FTSE is practically unchanged. Uh, similar for the GAC 40, that's gaining 0.1 percent. The DAX is down 0.1 percent. Now, a lot of the focus, of course, is on Federal Reserve officials. Uh, again, investors also weighing the impact of China's efforts to prop up its markets. If you look at Treasuries, pretty much steady after some strong economic data triggered the biggest two-day slump in months. Markets bet on the speed of rate cuts were, of course, dialed back. Now, to talk about the markets, we're now joined by Scholar Montgomery Coding, head of macro strategy at T.S. Lombard. Also with me, Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung Wilkins. So thank you both for joining us. Rebecca, let's just start off with you because there's so much appetite for investors away from Fed speak to try and understand what kind of China policy we'll have. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about decoding just how much support we're going to see for the uh, stock market here. Now, we did have this news that the Sovereign Wealth Fund was going to pump in some cash. Also, potentially, that Xi Jinping is going to be briefed by regulators, which is relatively unusual uh, for that to be public, at least. Um, and so... The hope for investors is that we are going to see authorities moving far more swiftly and far more decisively to try and halt the route that we've seen. Um, and investors have responded. It has been a couple of slightly sort of choppy days trading, but ultimately, we the last two days, we have come up higher. We've come off those lows that we had for the CSI 300, that key benchmark uh, on shore. We sort of, we were at sort of the lowest in around five, six years. We're now up off that. Same with the the mid caps and the small caps index that's the CSI 1000 which was also bearing a lot of the brunt of that sell off that has come up uh, quite a ways too but the big question remains just how much support we're going to see there's still some uncertainty around that so, uh, Rebecca, overall, I mean, if you look at some of the whipsaw in, um, you know, some of the Chinese equities, I don't know whether there's worry about the potency of what Beijing can do or actually the timing of it. And we go into a tricky week because we could also see a lot of volatility because of Chinese New Year where stock markets are closed. That's right, Francine. And I think actually that is absolutely critical here, unlike what we saw uh, with some other sort of volatile trading in 2015 and even in 2016, for example. I think the timing of this stock rat has really affected the management. It has added this extra urgency, uh, particularly when we thought about last week. You know, we were coming in some of the worst, uh, the worst week of trading since 2009 for, for one of the indexes there. It was really looked rough. And so there was this time pressure for authorities in particular particular to try and stabilize some of that sp spiral of panic selling. There is only one more day uh, of uh, trading before we go into this extended holiday for the onshore over the market. And of course, for retail investors too, there was this concern about going into the holidays where anything could happen um, theoretically. And there was a lot of uncertainty about you know whether or not to really keep hanging on to things, given the, this big question mark over just how much support Beijing is going to leverage. Now, another way of looking at this whole sort of situation is Beijing just needs to offer just enough support, just enough to stabilize the markets, just to get it to that Lunar New Year deadline. Yeah, and, th and uh, Skylar, when you look at, of course, some of the questions, and, and I love the way that you put it in your note, first of all, does the timing of the Fed cuts matter? But is the Fed even looking at what's happening in China or d does that change your investment point of view? 
I don't think it does in terms of, you know, China's recovery is, is bottoming, right? We've had this negative property sector issue going on for ages. We've had growth continue to disappoint because stimulus has continued to disappoint. And that's not changing, right? The problem is the consumer. The problem is confidence. And they're not trying to reflate a bubble in terms of the property market. So you're not going to get the same kind of stimulus feeding in. For the Fed, you know, the relationship there is if it's bottoming, it's not going to have a negative or positive impulse. If anything, it's maybe a little bit more positive for their outlook because there's deflation in China. Um, but I think, you know, certainly they're, they're more concerned with what's happening domestically than they are with what's happening overseas if it's not having a great global impulse. Uh, Skyler, we're obsessed with the timing of, uh, of the Fed cuts, and these are important. I mean, we analyze and come through every Fed speak, which is important. But actually, at the end of the day, does it really matter to fixed income or even to equities in the next six months if, if they go in, you know, in June or if they wait a, a little bit longer? Yeah, I mean, we have this obsession with, is it going to be a gradual cut? Is it going to be, you know, these 75 basis points of cuts this year, every other meeting, or is it going to be quite quick. And the market was looking for 150 to 160 basis points of cuts this year at some point. But throughout this gyration of cuts for this year, um, we've had pretty consistent pricing for how many cuts there's going to be in the cycle overall, both from consensus as well as from the market. And the market is looking for around 200 basis points of cuts of easing. And I think that's a, a pretty good bar. It's a pretty reasonable bar to have when you're thinking about both your fixed income allocation as well as your equity allocation. And for equities, if you get those cuts and growth remains strong, that's a very positive environment. And same for fixed income. You can justify lower yields off of 200 basis points, especially at the front end. Um, so we'd rather focus on the total easing cycle. And yes, we think you know front end cuts are, are too front loaded in terms of there's too much still priced in 2024. And you'll see daily gyrations off of that. But the story is really that we'll get 200 basis points overall as a minimum. And when you look at, I guess, you know, what that means for treasuries, Skylar, again, do, you know, do, does it change your, your kind of treasury allocation thinking? Yes. I mean, so it, it means generally what you see when you have Fed cuts is that treasuries rally. Um, you see strong gains both into and out of the first cuts because of total returns, right? So you have that carry component. For us, when we think about valuations, there's much more room to rally at the front end in terms of assuming 200 basis points. You can justify um, treasury yields of two years at, at around 380. So you've got more room there than at the 10 year, especially because there are more upside risks at the 10 year when you think about term premium and inflation and geopolitics and everything that fits in there. Um, but certainly, you know, the base case that we're not going to get hikes, that's a big deal. And at least 200 basis points of cuts justify some kind of allocation, and we think in the front end. Uh, Rebecca, this was the week where we also, you know, heard Donald Trump bashing China once again, talking about possible tariffs of up to, I think, 60 percent. Are, are his comments talked about in China? I think there is certainly a focus and an interest, particularly onshore, it seems, about what an, another Donald Trump presidency possibly means for Chinese equities. And, you know, saying that there was a response, in fact, in some of the uh, retailers in China of cheap exports, uh, PDD and so on, responding specifically to that comment by Trump. And so we do see these pockets uh, of the Chinese equity market where people are already anticipating and already thinking about how to respond to the risks that might might be involved uh, with another Trump presidency. There was an interesting Goldman Sachs report too. They, they went there and spoke to many of their mainland clients and they noted that in oh. fact, questions around the implications of Donald Trump's return, potential return, one of the most sort of uh, most commonly asked questions by some of their, their onshore clients. So it certainly is a, a cause for concern. And I think most fund managers are starting to think, if not already starting to act uh, and, and think about how to uh, sort of balance risk in their portfolios. Yeah, and Skylar, I guess this is a question that you also probably feel the most. Is like, how do you, you know, have a template for what Donald Trump would do in, in the White House for, for the economy? I mean, is it a positive for stocks or we just don't know yet? It's very hard. I think, you know, some kind of base case that you can make is that 
fiscal is, is probably going to be positive for the economy, but you think that under Biden or Trump, um, you know, that's a positive growth impulse and it's it's a positive relative to the rest of DM as well in terms of you're only really getting that fiscal and that scope for fiscal in the U.S. versus, say, Europe or the U.K. I think the only conclusion you can really make is that it's going to be more volatile. Um, people will be looking at Twitter or X again, um, you know, that kind of thing in terms of looking at headlines and, and how that's impacting the market. And then, you know, the other consideration is what's happening in China in terms of there's been much more hawkishness from Trump on China than there is from Biden. We've had this kind of detente actually more recently on U.S.-China relations, and that kind of comes into the crossfire again with Trump calling for great, you know, tariffs on Chinese exports and imports. Thank you both for joining us, Rebecca Chung Wilkins there, and staying with us, Skylar Montgomery, coding head of macro strategy at TS Lombard. Now, let's also look at what NYCB is doing pre market. Now, this is New York Community Bank Corp. The credit grade was cut to junk by Moody's less than a week after the regional lender alarmed shareholders, of course, by slashing payouts and stockpiling reserves to cover troubled loans tied to commercial real estate. On the back of that pre market, once again, 8.8% lower. Yesterday, it was already at the lowest since 19. 97. We explain the shareholder alarm next. This is Bloomberg. I do have a concern about commercial real estate. I believe it's manageable, although there may be some institutions that are quite stressed by this problem. Well, that was U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen testifying before the House Financial Services Committee. I have been told in the past that this is one of the things for that she prepares the most. She was very, very agile and able to actually bat away any questions about a precise bank. That's New York Community Bank Corps. And this is after the credit grade was cut to junk by Moody's less than a week after the regional lender or loan shareholders by slashing payouts, but also stockpiling reserves to cover troubled loans. And that was tied to commercial real estate. So Janet Ellen, not directly addressing, of course, uh, NYCB, but she did talk about um, the, the, the real estate sector as a whole and saying, look, regulators are on it. Pre-market, you can see New York Community Bank Corp down 9%. Let's bring in Bloomberg's finance team leader, Jennifer Serene. Jenny, thank you for joining us. I mean, this is, so what surprised me is that they did so badly. There were so many worries about them. The fact that they fall another 10% pre-market after Moody's cuts them. I mean, is it, is it just nervousness or is it warranted? Well, so I thought it was interesting when you look at the Moody's report, uh, one of the things that they really highlight was governance risk. So we had a big story out this week um, from our colleagues in the U.S. talking about how they had a couple of key executives in the risk um, and control lines depart in recent months. And, and this wasn't previously known. So I think what you're starting to see now is that, you know, Moody's and, and investors are like, whoa, 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 this isn't just a credit issue. This could be something bigger with executives. Um, we did have NYCB come out this morning with a statement saying, Saying, you know, yes, we've had these departures. We are actively looking to fill these roles. We want someone with big bank experience. So really trying to kind of put that matter to rest. But I do think that you see, um, you know, sort of this, this situation definitely evolving past just the, the CRE issue now. So, I mean, do we really worry about commercial real estate w within this bank? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely their biggest exposure. Um, and that's what they talked about the most when they were setting aside those reserves. Um, I guess it was just last week. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that's definitely the main focus, I think. Um, and what really folks are worried about here is that the size of the reserves yeah. that they put aside uh, was yeah. so much bigger than what the defaults looked like. And so you had, you know, two chunky defaults. They, they kind of outlined um, two different scenarios um, that were actual defaults in the quarter. But what they did was so much beyond that that folks are like, OK, so are you seeing real, real trouble here on the horizon? Like, is this something that, you know, we're going to see a lot more of in the coming months? And so I think that's really why, why investors are so cagey at this point um, is just that there's so much fear about what's to come. Jenny, thank you so much. As always, Jennifer Serene, their team leader for UK and Middle East finance. Now, also still with us, Skylar Montgomery Coding, head of macro strategy at TS Lombard. Skylar, is, is there worry that actually this spirals out of control? I mean, is there a, a kind of financial stability concern? I think we got an initial market reaction, but I think that speaks more to the market really looking for easing and wanting the cuts that it's priced to come sooner. I think more broadly, there isn't a stability concern. There isn't a systemic crisis. What we've seen 
over and over again throughout this hiking cycle, not just from the Fed and U.S. authorities, um, but from the Bank of England, from the ECB, is that there's an ability and willingness to come to the rescue or to prevent financial stability concerns. And we saw that back in March. Um, and, you know, if we did have a, a bigger risk or a biggest concern that I don't actually think we are getting, but if we did, then the Fed and authorities would step in quite quickly to stem it. Um, Skyler, overall, when we go back to central banks, I mean, what's more interesting? I know you, you also had a, a Swiss franc call, but could we see more surprises from the Bank of England than the ECB? Yeah, I think right now the market's probably too excited over 2024 cuts. I think that goes across central banks, so the Bank of England, the ECP, as well as the Fed. There's a lot of front-loaded cuts price. Um, saying that, you know, the view on the ECB is that they'll be forced to be more front-loaded with their easing than the Fed. The European economy is clearly stagnating, and we see downside risks to both growth and inflation. And the ECB has a very different inflation problem than the Fed, but responded in the same way. And that's meant in their attempt to chase the Fed, they've over-tightened. And, and the consequence of that is that they've damaged the economy, and they should have already cut, really. Um, in practice, that means we think they'll cut rates ahead of the Fed and closer to neutral. But if they wait for the Fed go-ahead, which is also a concern, then there's more damage to the economy. Thank you so much, Skyler Montgomery Coning, their head of macro strategy at TS Lombard. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets. We'll also look at the banking sector shortly. This is Bloomberg. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Tel Aviv today. Now, the meeting comes as Al Arabiya TV has reported that Hamas wants a 135-day truce that can be rolled out in three stages. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Israel Bureau Chief Ethan Broner. Ethan, thank you for joining us. So how close sure. are the hostage truce negotiations? I would say they're not close at all. Uh, I mean, they're alive. The negotiations exist. But when the Hamas response came la late last night here, the Israeli response was, well, this is close to a no from our perspective, but not so close that it's an actual no, so we could keep talking. But there are aspects to what Hamas wants that Israel says under no circumstances could it accept. One is a, a promise and a complete end to hostilities that Israel would, no, would end its war against Hamas, and two, that it would remove all its troops from Gaza. Israel says those are impossible for it to accept. So, Ethan, what is the view in Israel about ending, you know, the, the war in exchange for the hostages, and is that view different to what the leadership wants? Uh, well, I think that there is a split in Israel. I mean, the, there is an enormous amount of uh, emotional attachment, obviously, to the 100 or so, 80 to 100 living hostages still in Gaza, an enormous sense of obligation to bring them home, uh, and a desire to try to put that ahead of all other things. Uh, that is, the further left you go politically in this country, that is the stronger the feeling. The further right you go, in this country, you, the, the argument is that defeating Hamas and not giving in uh, is more important than the lives of these 80 to 100 hostages. And uh, Netanyahu is somewhere in between. So it's a little unclear where it's so, going to go. Yeah, Ethan, what will be the main message for, you know, from, from Secretary of State Antony Blinken when he meets with Netanyahu today? See, Blinken clearly wants a deal. He wants the war to be wound down. I mean, in theory, the United States backs Israel's plan to, 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 to take apart Hamas. But it, it sees what's going on in a broader context, in the regional context of uh, setting up an alliance against Iran, bringing in the Saudis and the Emiratis and so on, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, to help rebuild Gaza and to recreate uh, a Palestinian state option. So all of that is part of what uh, Blinken is bringing to the table. And uh, Israel is, uh, you know, is listening, but it's not at all clear that he's going to get his way. D does the prime minister Netanyahu stay in power? 
Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has um, no reason to leave power from his perspective, and there is no way to, there's no mechanism to have him leave power. He has a, a majority coalition of 64 seats in the 120 seat Knesset, and unless members of his coalition walk away from him, He's in power until at least 20, until 2026. So, uh, you know, it's not impossible to imagine that his coalition would crack. But those to his right who are supporting him in power, I think, understand that if they leave, they're unlikely to be returned to power. So they have little motive to move either. We also heard, Ethan, from you know, Saudi Arabia that they will have no ties with Israel unless the, the Gaza aggression ha has been halted. Are we going to see more countries say the same? Well, I mean, there at the moment, there are no relations between the Saudis and the Israelis officially anyway. So that isn't a loss. It's just a, not a potential gain. So far, the Emiratis, the Moroccans, the Bahrainis, and so on, Jordan and Egypt, have not ended their relationship with Israel. But look, it's a fair question. There's no doubt that in the region, all of the suffering and death in Gaza has been an incredible trauma to see on television uh, and a desire to, to force Israel to stop doing it. Absolutely a risk. Ethan, thank you so much. Ethan Broner there in Tel Aviv. Coming up, we talk banking, we talk Handel's banking, and we'll give you the very latest on that. This is Bloomberg. Fed's Loretta Mester says policymakers should gain confidence to cut later this year, but adds there's no need to rush. Her comments echo those of other Fed speakers. New York Community Bank Corp tumbles again in U.S. pre-market after Moody's cuts its lender to junk with concerns over loans tied to commercial real estate. Plus, a U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is set to meet Israeli leaders in the coming hours as Hamas suggests it's open to a new ceasefire and hostage release deal. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, shares in Handelsbanken have surged this morning after Sweden's largest property lender reported fourth quarter profit topping expectations. The new chief executive, Michael Green, announced plans yesterday to slim down the bank's management structure. Well, we are delighted to be joined from Stockholm by Carl Sederhard, the chief financial officer and executive vice president at Handelsbanken. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Many questions, of course, about the reorganization. And I guess the focus from a lot of shareholders that we speak to is your high reliance on net interest income. How will you ensure that revenues actually don't collapse if interest rates fall later this year? Well, thanks, Francine, and thanks for having me. Well, first of all, I think it's, uh, it's obvious, yes, correct, we are dependent on net interest income. We, we built this business model for 150 years, and we will keep being there, involved in it. So, so of course, we're working close with our clients, and, and we will continue doing so. So, uh, time will tell exactly where the PL ends up, but, but it's all good so far. I mean, is there any way that you can improve other streams of revenue, I guess, to, to, to have a better balance to make up for it? Improving our uh, net commission income, and we will definitely keep on working a lot with that one. You can see that we have performed very, very well for the last 15 years in that segment where we've been improving our... In, in Sweden, for instance, we have roughly a market share in most of the segments between 20 and 25. And in, in the savings market and in the asset management business, we have between 10 and 15, closer to 15 perhaps. But, mm -hmm. but so we have some room to move there, and we definitely put a lot of efforts into growing that. How attractive at the moment is private banking and wealth management? Very, very attractive, definitely. I mean, uh, the, we, we, that is one of the structural parts we've been growing very, very nicely in, and we, we put a lot of focus on continuing that one. We've also, of course, heard from you know, the new chief executives, this new slimmer group. What does that mean in terms of job losses? I know he was saying, for example, you know, in January that there was going to be a trimming of some of the overhead costs um, as some of the bank's function have grown out of proportion. Is there anything more that we can accept, you know, expect in the coming months? 
I think it's fair to say that we've been on a journey to, to, to improve the bank and, and uh, we, we've done quite a lot in the branch network. We've been working around the country structures. We've been divesting from a few pieces. Uh, uh, the journey is now up for actually improving the, the, uh, the, the support functions. And, and Michael will assume, and we have a history in the bank where actually the CEO is also the manager of the Swedish operation, which is by far the largest largest one in the bank. And Michael will assume that role, so he will be CEO as well as being heading the Swedish operation. That, that creates a possibility for us actually to merge and consolidate the support functions you have centrally with the support functions you have in the Swedish organization. And we will work quite a lot on that one. So, so, so that's definitely a journey which we will move into now. And, and, and that, of course, we will work a lot with efficiency. Mm -hmm. there. Uh, could you also talk us through why you've decided actually to increase the dividend instead of share buybacks, which some other banks are putting forward? Yes, I mean, uh, um, as you say, first of all, we increased the ordinary dividend from five and a half crowns to six and a half crowns. Then what we said is that we will, we will still run the bank extremely conservative. We, we've been doing that for ages and we put a lot of, uh, of, of, of focus on that one. So, so during 2024 we will run the bank with another percentage point above our normal target range. And, and in doing that, when we want to run the bank then four percentage points above our regulatory demand, that frees up capital to actually make an extra dividend of another six and a half crowns. So moving into 2024, we will more or less anticipate four percentage points above the regulatory demand and then adjust the, the, the dividend uh, accrual. And, and yes, as you are correct in that, we, we've, um, the proposal is now for an extra dividend and not for share buybacks. We still have the OK from the, from the AGM and we will look for a new approval at the AGM to perform buybacks. But as of now, we will, uh, we will do it with extra dividend. Uh, what's happening to your Finland operations? I know, I don't know, I, you know, can you update us on either a sale process or a winding down of the operation? And do you think that still makes sense? They've actually performed pretty solidly. No, we haven't changed any footing there. I mean, strategically, uh, we, we definitely work on the, in the four home markets we are. So we are looking to, to divest Finland, definitely. And, and yes, we're progressing towards the target of more or less selling half the operation. That will be done uh, by Q4 this year. The, the remaining half, we will work on both either selling or, or winding down. And, and uh, yes, as you say, obviously it's not a burden for the PNL as of now, mm -hmm. but still creating the best of bank, you need to be in areas where you can structurally be really competitive. And, and in that sense, we have def definitely stick to the decision to move, move out to Finland. Yeah. So today your share price is gaining 6.5%, yesterday gained 2%, but at the same time, if, if you look at the, the overall position, of some investors, it's one of the, um, I guess, banks that is also most shorted. C can you explain why you think that is, and have you had any conversations about this with anyone? Yeah, I think, uh, I think in many aspects, I mean, the international media has painted a picture over Sweden and over Handelsbanking, which has obviously been a headwind to us. It's been circulating around. Uh, large debt levels of the Swedish populations, a real estate sector needing to adjust and a weak crown. I think in, in many cases we've proven that wrong, at least for Handelsbanken. I mean, we have a really good client segment, uh, a very wealthy one. We have really good clients. Yes, we have, a, uh, we have a large proportion towards real estate sector, but we've proven that we have a very, very strong asset quality in that one. If the macro environment turns and, and we keep on proving, I mean, our, our, the bank's progress, I, I think uh, many factors are actually put point into quite decent behavior and performance of the stock. So, uh, so I think this is in line with it. Thank you so much for your time today, Carl Sedas Hurd, CFO and Executive Vice President as Venska Handels Banken for your time today. Now, a redhead crossing the Bloomberg terminal in the last few minutes, that means it's important news that we need to update you on. China has replaced the head of its securities regulator in a surprise move amid a sharp sell-off. 
in the nation's stock markets. Now, Wu Qing, a banking veteran, has been named as the head of the China Securities Regulatory Commission, and that's according to Xinhua News Agency. Coming up, some of the world's best-known asset managers increasing their bets on infrastructure and renewables. We discuss this with the leading energy investor next. This is Bloomberg. Now, the chief executive of De Beers has told Bloomberg that he's hoping to improve the transparency of diamond production in Angola, so consumers will be proud to own Angolan diamonds. Well, Al Cook was speaking after the De Beers signed agreements to boost production in the country, which is one of Africa's top diamond producers. The, um, there's only really been one diamond discovery in the entire of the 21st century, so there is a growing shortage of natural diamond. We are past peak supplies of natural diamonds, and we believe that Angola is the best place in the world to go exploring for diamonds. What does that mean then for 2024? I mean, what are you anticipating? Well, in 2024, we'll be investing for the long term. So in South Africa, that means ramping up the Venetia mine that we um, started up, the underground mine there that we started up just last year. In Botswana, that means ploughing ahead with our plans for the Zhuaneng underground mine and building on that. In Namibia, that means um, building up production from our new vessel, the Benguela Gem. And in Angola, that means moving forward at pace with exploration. So 2024 is about investing for the long term in our African producer countries. Well, let's talk about uh, at pace. Uh, what is what's the next step really with this MOU now that it's signed? I mean, what would at pace look like in 2024? So what we're doing in Angola is we're working below the ground and we're working above the ground. So below the ground, we've got two exploration blocks. We signed those in 2022 and we're actively exploring on those at the moment. And that means airborne surveys followed by drilling. But what's really important uh, in Angola is above the ground, and that starts with the reforms that President Lorenzo has brought in, driving transparency across Angola. But what we're doing in our new agreement is we are supporting the Angolan government, bringing the best of our gem fair technology from Sierra Leone, bringing the best of our sorting technology from Botswana, and bringing all those to bear in Angola so that we can really lift the standards of the whole value chain and make sure that we're really proud to sell a diamond from Angola. Well, the De Beers Chief Executive Al Cook there speaking to our very own Jennifer Zabazaja a little earlier. Now, we often talk about the energy transition and rising demand for innovation like electric vehicles and sustainable energy. Now, the infrastructure that actually underpins all of this, from power grids to data centers, usually gets less attention. But the asset class is now the flavor of the month, with some of the world's largest asset managers boosting their exposure, including BlackRock's $12.5 billion deal to buy global infrastructure partners. So let's discuss the sector with Roland Dürig. He's a managing partner at the Zurich investment firm Energy Infrastructure Partners. Roland, thank you for joining us today. I mean, there's so much that we need to talk about to try and really understand where you see the most value and how you see this industry transforming. C can you talk to me a little bit about your investment in Platitude? So, you know, what's, what are the most interesting projects that you see coming up on the grid? Yeah, good, good morning and thank you for, for uh, being, being here. Um, look, our investment in Plenitude um, reflect, reflects really our investment strategy into holistically covering the um, respective asset classes which are important to, to make energy transition um, uh, happen. Right, and with ENI, we have really a, a great, fantastic uh, industrial partner who is dedicated on what we are doing in Plenitude, and who brought us as a specialist energy sector investor into their, I would say, crown jewel they have into mm -hmm. into the energy transition space. So, so it's f a fantastic. We we are partnering with ENI in Plenitude. It 
And plenitude, I mean, I understand that the, the IPO is possibly, you know, delayed, postponed probably um, to, the, to, you know, to this year. What's your view on, on when this will actually happen? Have there any filings been, been put in place? Like, you know, how, how serious is this? <laughs> I mean, uh, look, honestly, uh, I am not in a position to comment on a potential IPO of uh, Plenitude. Um, what I can tell you is that um, from a strategic and financial perspective, um, ENI and us, we do not have to uh, IPO Plenitude um, uh, as such. Right. It's a strategic option. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. an option and it might come or it might not come. I, I, I would not comment further on that one. Mm -hmm. So give me a sense of, you know, when you look at investing in renewables and the infrastructure that underlies it, Roland, where, where do you see the best value? Where do you see the biggest opportunities that so far have been untapped? Yeah. So I think what is important to understand, and we are doing that now since um, 10 years, nothing else than this, is mm -hmm. that in order to energy transition to, to happen uh, robustly, um, we need to invest in a large scale amount of diversified technologies to produce decarbonized um, electricity, number one. Number, that's the number one growth um, mm -hmm. engine, if you want. But the second growth engine, and it gets often uh, uh, off the table, but it, it, it's now very evident, very visible, is transportation and distribution, the grid, right? Uh, molecule mm -hmm. grid, today gas transportation infrastructure, but also electricity um, grid need um, a lot of uh, investments just to maintain the, 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 the security of supply we have today. But then uh, in order to really make the energy transition happening, um, it has to be expanded um, a lot, right? Talking about, for mm -hmm. example, Germany, where we have a lot of wind uh, energy, wind mm -hmm. electricity being produced in the north. Um, but needed actually in the south. So you need to, the infrastructure, the transportation line to get electricity, electrons from A to B. Mm -hmm. So give me so a sense these again, are what's the mainly relative the appeal? And Roland, yeah, you, you were talking about Germany, but what's the relative appeal of the US given it has the Inflation Reduction Act compared to investments here in Europe? Yeah, um, of course, the, uh, the act is uh, a, a very attractive scheme to invest in, in these assets in the U.S. Um, as a boring Swiss um, asset manager, um, we like to have a fundamental long-term necessity of the, of the assets we are investing in. This is why we invest, and that's important, in the US as we do in Europe and still do in Europe. As an investor, it's all about diversification, to be very clear. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, geog geographical diversification um, because political um, uh, uh, directions and supporting schemes, they might change. And this happened mm -hmm. in, in the past. So from an investor perspective, we diversify uh, technology-wise, partner-wise, country-wise, and mm -hmm. as I said, renewable to um, regulated transportation distribution asset to flexible asset. Flexibility is very, mm -hmm. very key these days. This is why in mm -hmm. we invest in hydro hydropower and then also storage. Yep. It's about covering holistically all the sectors which are, which are needed. Well, I, I was going to ask you actually about storage. Is, is energy storage a place to invest? Is it too early? Or is there also just too much tension on this? Look, um, uh, honestly, it, it depends on what storage are we talking about, right? We invest in uh, hydropower, so dams, which are from scale and ecological, economical perspective, by far the most attractive way to store energy. But then uh, we invest into molecule storage, where today uh, mm -hmm. you store uh, gas molecules, but tomorrow um, the same asset 
uh, will be might be reused for hydrogen for green hydrogen right um, mm -hmm. and the same holds true true with batteries so mm -hmm. um, but w that, that, that's the point uh, we need of course the mm -hmm. political regulatory framework in order to uh, make storage uh, and in the different technologies I just said um, financially uh, uh, doable Thank you so much, Roland Durig there of Energy Investment Partners. Now, coming up, investigators pinpoint the cause of the mid-air blowout on board a Boeing 737 MAX 9. We'll discuss why the plane maker has more questions to answer. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Now, U.S. investigators say a panel which blew out of a M Boeing 737 MAX 9 in midair was missing four bolts. The Alaska Airlines flight was forced to make an emergency landing after the blowout on January 5th. The National Transportation Safety Board says photos show four bolts were removed for work at Boeing's factory in Renton, but not replaced. Bloomberg senior aviation reporter Sid Phillip is here with us. Sid, I mean, every day, it's just not great news. It kind of makes you really worried about, you know, what, you know where Boeing goes from here. It is. It, it's a very sort of shocking conclusion, uh, even though it's sort of preliminary findings. But the fact that four bolts were missing from the door shows that there was some sort of slippage in terms of quality control at Boeing. And I think that's really going to sort of put uh, airlines, investors, everyone under pressure as to how does Boeing improve its quality and make sure that incidents like this don't really happen again. Sid, I, I know it's a tricky question because we're just at the beginning, but who, whose fault is this? I mean, is this like Boeing is a third supplier? Like if... if you know, who do you point the finger to? Uh, at the moment, obviously, the investigation is still premature yeah. in terms of who is responsible personally. But I think at the end of the day, it is Boeing's aircraft because Boeing built the aircraft. And the CEO accepted as much, saying that they are responsible for quality at, at Boeing. And so it is a Boeing aircraft and it is Boeing's responsibility. Um, is it Boeing supplier Spirit Aerospace is planning to changes or is planning changes to executive pay? What do we know about that? Yeah, so Spirit Aerosystems reported their earnings yesterday, which is also a big day for everything else. Yeah. Uh, and among the things that the CEO talked about was the fact that he was going to link management pay to quality. And that's because Spirit is Boeing's biggest supplier. They make most of the mm -hmm. 737 MAX. And the, the, there's been a lot of slippages in quality over the past year, excluding the door incident. And the latest issue which came up on Sunday was the fact that they had misdrilled holes on the 737 MAX. And that could potentially affect 50 undelivered 737 MAXs. So essentially, Spirit is really sort of trying to ramp up its quality. And that's really key to that whole messaging, the fact that they have to get their quality control back in order in order to be able to deliver planes that... Uh, Boeing yeah. can sort of count on. And so this is just for the, the 737 MAX, right? And, and not many, I mean, are they still flying? Uh, yeah, 737 MAX is back in the air. Uh, the, it, was, it was grounded briefly, the MAX 9 was grounded briefly, and now it's sort of back in service. And it's really a question of getting those planes, uh, about 94% of the 737 MAX 9 are mm -hmm. back in service. Mm -hmm. And the MAX deliveries have continued all, all along. Yep. And so it's really a question of making sure that quality as it goes through keeps sort of on target and point. Sid, Sid, as always, thank you so much uh, for making us smarter on aviation. That was Sid Phillip. But now, very quickly, New York Community Bancorp. So the credit grade was actually downgraded. It was cut to junk by Moody's. And this is less than a week after the regional lender also alarmed shareholders by slashing payouts and stockpiling reserves. And you can see, actually, pre-market, that stock, once again, down 9.5%. Bloomberg Brief, that's up next.